Everybody who is involved in the game of football should understand why we do doping controls. This is a very strict procedure and it's also a long-term strategy in fight against doping. We have developed a procedure which is applicable for every competition. So same procedure, same regulation for men, women, even in the under-16 competition, the procedure is done exactly in the same way. The doping control officers, they have to be physicians because we have the same relationship as we have between patient and doctor. We have an active role in taking body fluids, urine and in particular blood, which is related to our professional attitude, to our ethical and professional laws. A DCO should make between three to five controls minimum a year to keep the routine. And even then, the evening before, the DCO has to watch the video in detail with their colleagues just to keep up the routine and again reduce the human errors to absolute minimum. The moment there is proof of a prohibited substance, either in urine or blood, then every single step will be checked. And if there is a wrong sign or crossed in the documents, then there is an open discussion about the invalidity of the sampling procedure. To perform FIFA's doping control procedure, a doping control officer or DCO is required, along with an assistant from the local organizing committee. There must also be chaperones under the testing authority of FIFA and security. There needs to be a doping control room with a specific area for testing, several tables and at least four chairs. For the blood test, the phlebotomist requires an area and a chair. There also needs to be a toilet. There must also be a doping control waiting room containing at least eight chairs, a locked cupboard, air conditioning, a shower, towels, drinks, a lockable fridge and a biological waste container. In the hotel on the day of the match, as much of the doping control form, or DCF, is filled out as possible. At the stadium, two hours before kickoff, everything necessary for the testing must be set out correctly in the doping control room and the waiting room. The testing kits are laid out on one of the tables. One hour before kickoff, the doping control officer hands the team representatives a form which they must fill out with a list of prescribed medications that the players are taking to be returned to the DCO before kickoff. To select the two players from each team who will undergo the urine or the blood tests, two sets of tokens are needed, numbered 1 to 23. At half time, the doping control officer, the assistant, and the representative of each team meet in the doping control room for the draw. The number of each token represents the number of a player on the team sheet. The teams are divided into Team A and Team B, and either can be drawn first. The tokens are poured into a bag, and the assistant picks out the first token. Without anyone seeing the number, the token is placed into an envelope which is sealed. The DCO and the team representatives initialize the envelope. The same process is followed for the other players from each team. The four envelopes from each team are placed into a bigger envelope, along with the extra tokens. That larger envelope is also initialized. In the 75th minute, the same four people reconvene for the opening of the envelopes. The doping control officer looks after Team A and the assistant Team B. The four envelopes are shuffled together and then one is chosen. The envelope is cut open and the token reveals the number of the player. This player's urine or blood sample will be tested for EPO. Then the other envelopes are cut open and the identities of the other players are revealed. The envelopes for players 3 and 4 from each team remain on standby in case the two players who've been selected are injured. Each player must have a doping control form referring to their test. The doping control officer and the assistant write the players' names on the forms. 
They sign the forms as do the players' representatives who keep the pink copies. The four green forms go to the FIFA general coordinator, while the envelopes with the names and numbers of the players are given to the chaperones. The chaperones head to the field to observe their selected players. It's one player per chaperone. At full time, the chaperones must wait patiently to collect their players and then escort them straight to the doping control waiting room. The players are not allowed to go anywhere else en route. If they do, they might contaminate the doping control process. The players who are waiting for their test or are unable to pass urine must stay in the doping control waiting room. They are encouraged to drink so they pass urine sooner. They may shower, use their mobile phones, watch TV, change clothes and eat food brought to them. Once the player feels that she is ready, she notifies the team representative or the doping control officer. The DCO checks the player's accreditation and her team number. The player's name and date of birth are filled out on the doping control form. After being made aware of the contents on the back of the form concerning the process and requirements of doping control, the player signs the form. Her signature thereby gives informed consent to take part in doping control. The DCO requests that the player chooses a plastic case containing a beaker from a sealed and numbered urine test as well kit. As one of the, brown boxes. the player must be able to choose from a selection of at least three urine test kits. The player puts aside the kit and opens the package containing the beaker by tearing the marked plastic along one side. The player must ensure she doesn't put her fingers inside the beaker, as this could contaminate the sample. The DCO explains that at least 90 ml of urine must be produced for the test. The player takes the beaker into the bathroom, accompanied by the DCO or the assistant. Once inside the bathroom, the player pulls down her shorts to her knees and her shirt up to her bra and urinates into the beaker, under the direct supervision of the DCO or the assistant. At all times, the DCO or the assistant must have an unobstructed view of the urine leaving the player's body. When the player returns with her urine sample, the DCO checks the amount of urine and writes the figure in the form. The player is then given the option of either opening the urine test kit herself or allowing the DCO to do it on her behalf. It is opened by pulling apart the plastic as guided by the arrows on the packaging. Whoever is undertaking the procedure removes the two glass bottles, A and B, the folded plastic container and the instruction pamphlet and puts the container box to one side. She takes off the bottle tops and the plastic around the bottlenecks and checks the number on each bottle to ensure that it matches the number on the outside of the box. Taking the beaker that has the player's urine, she ensures that the lid is tightly closed by pushing down hard enough to hear a double click. The player decides whether they themselves or the DCO will pour the urine into the bottles. The decision is documented in the doping control form or DCF. If the player does it, the DCO explains the procedure. Bottle B is filled to a minimum of 30 ml. The remainder is poured into bottle A to a minimum of 60 ml. If there is more, bottle A and then bottle B are filled to capacity. A small amount is left in the beaker. The time at which the urine is poured into the bottles is noted in the doping control form. The player, or if she prefers the DCO, screws on the glass bottle lids as tightly as possible and turns the bottle upside down to ensure there is no obvious leaking. The number on the bottles is rechecked and written on the form by the DCO. The small amount of urine left in the bottle is checked for its specific gravity. The DCO does this by using a chemical coloured test tape. The colour on the test tape after urine absorption is compared to the colour chart and the specific gravity figure is written into the DCF. The player or DCO places the glass bottles into the designated plastic containers and seals them, getting rid of all the air. The sealed bottles inside the sealed plastic containers are then returned to their original box. During the completion of the doping control form, the DCO asks the player if she is happy for her urine to be used for research, indicating as such on the form. The DCO also asks whether the player has any questions or comments that she would like noted on the doping control form. The form is comprehensively reviewed. 
The time is filled in and it is signed by the GCO, the team representative and the player. Once everything is completed, the DCO tears off the pink copy of the DCF and hands it to the team representative as proof that the entire doping control procedure has been adequately completed. The blue copy will be sent to the laboratory. The top copy goes to the FIFA anti-doping unit. The player is asked to dispose of any excess urine in the beaker and to throw the beaker into the biological waste bin. The player is now free to leave the DCR with a doping control procedure fully completed. Thank you very much. If a player produces a urine sample of less than 90 mil, then this is called a partial sample. The amount of urine in the partial sample is written on a special designated part of the DCF. The player may open the urine testing kit herself or ask the DCO to do it on her behalf. As it is a partial sample, only bottle A is required. Bottle A's plastic covering is unwrapped, the lid is removed, but the red plastic ring on the bottleneck is left on and the bottle number is checked to make sure it corresponds with the number on the box as before. The partial sample of urine is poured into bottle A. The stopper is put into position to temporarily seal the bottle and the lid is put on. Note that the lid is not screwed on permanently yet. Bottle A is now returned to the original brown box and closed. The player is asked to select a partial sample sealing kit, which has its own identification number. The number of this kit is noted in the DCF. The kit is opened by the player or DCO. The brown test box with the partial sample and the temporary lid is placed into the plastic bag and sealed. The bag is placed on a table to the side and the player heads back to the doping control waiting room to drink more fluid. Once the player is ready to pass urine again, she selects a new beaker, takes it out of its plastic container and goes to the bathroom accompanied by the doping control officer or the assistant. Once the player has produced another urine sample, the DCO opens the partial sample kit from earlier and checks the identification number with the player. She removes bottle A, which contains the partial sample, and bottle B and opens them both. If there is still not sufficient urine, the process is repeated as before. If there is sufficient urine, the DCO adds the partial sample from bottle A to the new beaker of urine and returns the lid, confirming it is closed with a double click. The combined amount of urine is written in the form. It is then poured into bottle B to above the minimum line as shown on the bottle. The remaining urine is added to bottle A, again above the minimum line, leaving a small amount left in the beaker for specific gravity testing. The player closes the bottles as tightly as possible. The DCO checks the specific gravity of the urine left in the beaker and writes the number in the form, continuing the rest of the process as normal. When all four players have been tested, the blue part of the doping control form is put in plastic folders. An exempt human specimen sticker is placed on each of the boxes containing the urine samples. The DCO fills out the chain of custody form. A copy is handed to a courier. The forms and the boxes are placed inside a designated transport container. The courier transports the samples to the testing lab. For the blood test, as with the urine test, the DCO must do the necessary checks to ensure it is the correct player in the doping control room. The player must give her consent and sign the consent form. The DCO asks the player to pick a test kit. The player is then asked which arm she would like to be used for the test and she is given the option of lying down or sitting to have her blood taken. The player decides if it's her or the DCO who opens the kit using scissors. The numbers on the three bottles and the stickers are checked to ensure they are identical. Blood must be extracted into three different test tubes. The test tube with a purple top is for EDTA and will go in the bottle with a red mark. The bottles with the yellow marks are for the A and B samples, which go into the test tubes with the yellow tops. 
The blood control officer, or BCO, tightens the venous tourniquet around the player's upper arm and cleans the area where she will draw blood with antiseptic. The BCO inserts the butterfly needle into the vein and the blood is extracted using a vacutainer. The BCO hands the test tubes to the DCO, who seals them, mixes the blood by turning them up and down, adds the correct numbered sticker lengthways and puts them in their designated bottles. While the third test tube is being filled, the BCO removes the venous tourniquet. Once the needle is removed, the BCO cleans the area where the needle was injected and adds the plaster. The player or the team representative checks that the bottles are tightly closed and they are put into their plastic containers ready for travel. The DCO fills out the remainder of the form, adding the numbers and the time of the blood extraction. The player is asked whether she has any comments about the procedure. All the people present check the form before it is signed. The player signs it last. The pink form goes to the team representative, the blue copy to the laboratory and the white copy to FIFA. The cooling box is activated by pressing hard on the two buttons on the reverse of the lid. The bottles are placed inside. The monitoring device that guarantees the right temperature for analysis of the samples is activated on the cooling box. The chain of custody form is filled out. The courier tapes together the box and heads off. Finally, all the waste that has been put into the biological waste container is removed.